What is a Buddhist monk's profession? What can we learn from a Buddhist monk's perspectives on life and work? And what does that have to do with using English? I think it's um, when you put your energy and time, it's, uh, that's your profession. A housemaker makes houses. Uh, an arrow maker makes arrows, a free human being makes himself, and that's the, the profession of a monastic, to shape uh, his own life, to pay attention to the way he does, he or she does things. And um, what we do is actually very simple as monastics. We walk, we uh, eat, we rest, we shower. The only difference is that we are paying attention to the action we do. When we walk, we are aware that we are walking. When we eat, we are aware that we are eating. That's what I do in my professional life. I eat mindfully. I walk mindfully. I try to speak mindfully. So uh, it's actually not so different. The only difference is that uh, maybe people outside, outside in the world, when they walk, they are thinking something else, worried about the past or the future. When they eat, maybe they are eating their anxiety, their preoccupations. This video is so special to me. I recently had the great fortune of being able to spend some time with Brother Dukdri from the Plum Village tradition. Dukdri lives in France, but he's currently visiting this side of the world. And so we met up to speak about learning and using English in his own real life context. During his visit, we were able to speak on several occasions and he was kind enough to be open to my filming any questions that I wanted to ask him about English, using English, and learning it effectively for real life communication. And do stay until the end because Brother Dukhtri speaks to you directly if you are trying to improve your English skills and incorporate them into your professional life. Please, pour yourself a cup of tea or a glass of water, sit back, relax, and enjoy this most happy and fortuitous of conversations. So here we are with Brother Dukdri. Thank you so much for allowing me to interview you today. And so if it's okay with you, I'll just jump in and ask the first question. Okay. And it's about you and who you are and where you're from mm -hmm. and what your first language is. Okay. So my name is Brother Duk Tri. The word Duk means virtue and the word Tri means wisdom. It's a Vietnamese name. I'm a Buddhist monk in the Plum Village tradition. I'm from Mexico. I've been ordained since uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. So your first language is Spanish, Spanish yes. which is quite different from English, yes. but we're speaking in English right now. Mm -hmm. So you're a monk in the Plum Village tradition, and as you know, I integrate mindfulness practices into my program, and it is my experience that through this kind of practice that helps calm body, emotions, and mind, mm -hmm. we're... We're, we're, we're sort of more open and spacious and, and receptive to, um, let's call it, uh, effective learning. Would you, would you agree with that? Sure, totally. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the practice of mindfulness can definitely help you to be more relaxed, to be less judging of yourself and others. In this, in the process of... Uh, Learning English has been something helpful also for me. Yeah. Great. So why don't we just move into that section and uh, let me ask you a little bit about the role that English plays in your life as a monastic. Tell mm -hmm. me a little bit about, well, tell us um, a little yeah. bit about 
you know, the, yes, so how, how does English play a part in your everyday life? Yeah, well, although the monastery is in France, uh, life in the monastery is in English. So all my interactions with other people will be in English. So in order to survive, in order to do all my activities that I need to do during the day, I have to speak in English and I have to understand English. So it's a big, big part of uh, my life at the monastery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you arrived, did you speak English the way you do now? Not at all, no. I wasn't able to ask for a broom. Or <laughs> I didn't know how to ask for yeah, the mop things like this. I, my vocabulary was very limited. So I improved a lot my English in um, Plum Village, yeah. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the, the community there because, like you're saying, it's based in France, but not all the monastics speak French and not all the monastics are French mm -hmm. because the tradition is... Vietnamese, yeah. right? So tell us a little bit about the the community and so it's not just you that needs to speak English. So English is the lingua franca, right, of the community. Yeah. Well, Plum Village is a multicultural community. So we have uh, monastics from all over the world and um, the, the most practical language to speak is English. Most of the brothers and sisters come from Vietnam we have few brothers from, from France, Germany, Portugal, from Mexico, myself, one brother from Guatemala. It's like a, from all over the world. And the, the most practical for everyone is to speak in, in English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have, um, most of us, we don't speak uh, perfect English, but just good enough to understand each other. Great, and, and this is, thank you for clarifying that, because it's something that I mention in my community a lot. <laughs> so thank you for clarifying that, because it's something that I mention in my community a lot. Uh, people, when they, when they join, they feel very nervous when they need to interact in English. Um, and they also need to interact with people from other countries. So it's not just the US or the UK uh, mm -hmm. that they speak with. Australia, of course, perhaps that's the case. But many times they need to speak to people in China, in India or other countries. And they find it very difficult to, to understand what the other is saying and to be able to communicate what they want to say in a way that can be understood. Mm -hmm. And so then there's already this tension that prevents... Um, you know, joyful communication between between two people because at the end of the day that's what it is, communi communication between two or more people in a language that is not the native language for everybody involved. So mm -hmm. um, I guess that's a parallel to your life in the, in the monastery. Yeah, that was my experience when I just arrived. The first retreat that I took, it was in the United States, in Deer Park. So I was very shy and very judgmental of myself because I wasn't able to express myself fluently on, in English. And um, yeah, but I was very fortunate. I met this brother, Brother Mantoe, <laughs> and he was facilitating um, a circle of, uh, we call it Dharma sharing, a circle in, in which uh, we all have the opportunity to speak, to share how do we feel, etc. So when he was facilitating the circle, I noticed that his vocabulary was more limited than mine. However, he was able to facilitate the session very confident and very relaxed. And, and I was like, a, wow. The only difference is that he's not afraid of being uh, judged. I'm afraid of being judged and that's my limitation. He's not afraid and he explained everything very well with a very limited English, but uh, very clear and very simple. And that was a lesson for me that it was my mind, my own obstacle, my judging mind that is telling me that I'm afraid of um, looking stupid. Right. Yeah. But that's a, a very good point and to, to kind of uh, bring it to, to the program that I offer, it's about confidence and mm -hmm. fluency. Of course, it is about 
improving English and there's lots of tools and resources in my program that help people with that purpose but what we focus on is on this judging mind that you're talking about, on this attitude of fear, of feeling uh, stressed and and um, uncomfortable, and life is already stressful enough, mm-hmm. you know, without English being another stress factor. So that's a, a big part of the program that I offer. Yeah. Just jumping in here to ask: Are you limiting yourself when it comes to English? Do you resonate at all with what Brother Dukdri is saying? If so, and if you'd like to find a way out, then do click on this link, which you'll find in the description box below, to apply and see if you're a good fit to join my continuous English training program. I'm looking forward to speaking with you. Could you share with us a few tips or strategies that you yourself remember using to mm-hmm. improve your English as you um, became more yeah. fluent? Well, first of all, for me, it's I have to be ready to make mistakes and in, in, uh, not being afraid of making mistakes. And I always ask people, like I explain, you know, I'm still learning English, so if you please, please tell, let me know if you notice that I say something that it's incorrect. Please help me, otherwise I will never <laughs> uh, learn to speak in English. Sometimes I record myself. I try to explain something, to express something that I want to say in English. So I record myself, and then I listen to myself. And I realize that uh, it's, maybe it's not clear or maybe I can say it in a different way that it's more clear. Things like this, I, I, it's kind of my practice. Also, I check my pronunciation. I record myself, I listen to myself, and then I notice that, wow, I didn't, I didn't know I was pronouncing this word uh, this way. So uh, this, uh, this kind of exercises um, help me um, in trying to find ways that is um, enjoyable. Things that I like and that I enjoy, like music, in um, looking for the translation of the song. If I don't understand it correctly or, or perfectly, looking for the translation of the song and being able to sing in, the, in English and uh, knowing the meaning of the words that I'm singing is something that helps a lot uh, in, my, in my learning English practice. Awesome. It's an excellent idea to record yourself and then listen to the recording yourself if you're able to distinguish, you know, or maybe you have a friend, an English speaking friend, um, or, you know, a coach, a mentor, a teacher who can listen to the recording and give you feedback on specific things. But in, in my experience as a teacher, what I try and do is reduce correction mm-hmm. to a minimum, um, a correction or suggestions or things like this, um, so that it doesn't interfere with this this anxiety that people mm-hmm. already are feeling. You know, I I have felt in in my Portuguese, for example, it depends on how people tell me that I'm doing okay or that I could have done it better. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes I do berate myself. I say, oh. Yes, this is the correct word, and I said this. Mm -hmm. And then for days it stays with me like a long (laughs) shadow, you know. And it shouldn't, because. but I also have that judging mind, so Mm -hmm. I I understand what what you're saying. And uh, from what you said about introducing with saying, oh, please let me know if I make any mistakes, and then Mm -hmm. I can... can improve I tr- you know but what do you think about this with my community I <laughs> I try to to tell my community that they don't have anything to apologize for mm. you know that of course they speak another language so expecting themselves to to speak English perfectly is is a huge expectation and and not not necessary. So I I find myself less and less apologetic with mm-hmm. my Portuguese. Like everybody that I interact in Portuguese with, they already know that Portuguese isn't my first language, and so not apologizing has 
has helped me to feel that wait, I, I, I belong here, you know, it's okay for me to speak in this language, even though I'm not doing it perfectly, even though I'm making mistakes. Um, they are listening to me. They are not losing their patience or, you know. Um, so what, 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 do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think um, it's definitely one of the, the biggest obstacles, like um, to be afraid of, uh, of the judgment of the other people in, in apologizing is, is a kind of obstacle. But at the same time, for me, it's, it's not about apologizing, but asking for help. Mm-hmm. Please help me. Because I really want to, to learn this language. Please help me to, to speak it correctly. I really want to learn. Oh my God, that's so good. Yeah. I love that. That's going to be so helpful. Mm-hmm. Thank you, brother. You were also telling me before recording about writing things down. Yeah. And then, and then maybe asking an English-speaking brother for their feedback mm-hmm. or, or you yourself. Um, using a translator, perhaps, yeah. but not for long texts, right? Just phrases or... Yeah, this is something that I used to do, especially at the beginning of my monastic life, because my vocabulary was very limited, and there were, there were many things that I wanted to say, and I wasn't able to say it in English. So what I started to do was, when I know that um, it's going, I will have the chance to, to speak, to say something, I prepare in advance. So I, at least I say, okay, this, at least this I want to, to be able to express it. And then I, I write it in English and then check with a friend, or, is this the right way you say this? Is this the, does it make sense? And, uh, and then I receive feedback and then I check, okay, at least this small phrase, at least this paragraph, I know how to express it. And little by little. Because yeah. we, ha- we all have many things that uh, as monastics we will repeat many times. Mm-hmm. So slowly, okay, this phrase, I know how to say it. Okay, this part of my life, I know how to share about this part of my life. And slowly it's accumulating and, and yeah. And that's also something that is very important for people to, to realize is that even, for example, when they've reached a level of um, autonomy, you know, they're able to express the basics and perhaps a bit more, there's still such a long way to go and expecting to jump from autonomy, say an intermediate level of English, to proficiency in in a question of months, well, it's unrealistic. So mm-hmm. I love what you say that having patience towards oneself, having um, a, a compassionate attitude, an open attitude, and and allowing things to to mature with with time is mm-hmm. also a a, a, a better. Um, sort of approach would you would you say to improving yeah definitely patience is a big big aspect of this plays uh, an important role and um it's been a long process it's as you said it's not like uh, from one day to the other or in a few months it doesn't work like that it's uh, slowly and uh, steadily Perfect. with diligence there you go. I use these words a lot. You mm. know, I do wor- I use words like being diligent, um, being kind, being patient, having a friendly attitude uh, towards oneself, towards one's capacity. Uh, and, and if one makes a mistake or if one isn't able to do something or or feels, oh, I, I need to study English right now and every day for two hours, I discourage that. Mm-hmm. And I say, look, just do as much as you want to do and get involved with um, topics that you're interested in, that you mm-hmm. enjoy. That's a much more pleasant path yeah. towards proficiency than being, you know, very imposing um, sort of schedules and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, in my case, I think something that um, really, really helped me 
is the fact that I live in, a, in an English-speaking community. So I have no option. Even if I didn't want to, I will learn English because all the life, every single interaction will be in English. So that's, that helped me not to put too much emphasis in I have to learn. Right. Because even if I didn't want, uh -huh. since all my, my surrounding is uh, English-speaking, I will kind of uh, automatically learn. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's called, in, in language learning, it's called immersion, right? Mm -hmm. So total immersion. Yeah. So many people, for example, wanting to learn English, they, they travel to an English-speaking country mm -hmm. and they stay there for some time, two weeks, um, and, and they go to lessons. And English does improve, you know, substantially during that period. And then they return to their non-English-speaking country mm -hmm. and find it difficult to make progress because mm -hmm. they're not in that immersion um, environment. But what I say in my program is that we can create immersion-like conditions in our home and of course it isn't going to be the same as living in an English-speaking community but it is something that we can do to expose ourselves to English um, often mm -hmm. and yeah so that's that's what I encourage in my program mm -hmm. what do you think about that I think it's great yeah totally yeah yeah even before I, I moved to the monastery um, I try to be always in touch with uh, material in English, music, movies, um, different things that somehow will be watering in me the seed of uh, English speaking. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, brother, for this interview. I really appreciate it. My practice and the practice of the monastery is uh, when we eat, eat mindfully, eat fully present uh, with the food that we are eating. Wow. And, and so carrying that over to learning English, mm -hmm. what would you say to anybody watching this video who is a professional and who, would, who knows that they want to make improvements to their English. What, what could you say to them? Yeah, of course, mindfulness is something that can really help to, um, let's say, develop the state of mind in which learning is easier. And you were mentioning the other day that your experience of no of, of of learning English and of becoming proficient has has done a lot for you, right? Yes. So what do you tell people who It's totally it totally changed your mind and your life once you learn uh, English. English is it opens so many doors in your life that it's incredible how uh, my life changed in how everyone's life can change if you are able to speak in English. So I, I, I really encourage everyone to find a way, to find your method, to find something that fits with you, um, that can help you to learn English because it makes really a big difference in your life. Okay, so that was such a wonderful opportunity for me to speak with Brother Duke Three on several occasions and record these uh, reflections of his about his own experience learning and incorporating English into who he is. So now I'd like to ask you a few reflection questions. The first one is, do you relate to Brother Dukhtri's experience of feeling shy in English-speaking contexts? How can you manage these feelings to your advantage? You know, I myself, I consider myself an introvert, so it's quite surprising, although, I mean, it's surprising to some extent, but to another extent, I'm sure it's not surprising at all that I'm actually an English teacher, that I speak in public, that I have this channel, you know, having these feelings of um, 
shyness myself. So I'd love to hear if you also relate to that. Write a comment in the section below about your experience. The next question is, how is your judging mind preventing you from developing personally and professionally? How is it standing in the way of your dreams? The next question that arose from this wonderful conversation with Brother Dukdri is, are you ready to make mistakes? This is something that, as I mentioned to him, I also suffer from a lot. I consider myself a recovering perfectionist. <laughs> um, and so I don't take it to heart so much anymore when I make mistakes. It's fine. What about you? The next question is, how much enjoyment is there for you when you think about English or in English or when you interact in English? This is such an important question and I'm so happy that Brother Dukhtri spoke about it because of course we're going to be much more capable of learning effectively when we are enjoying what we do. And the final question that arose for me as I reviewed my conversation with Dukhtri is what about the importance of repetition? To practice means to repeat. How often do you practice through repetition? Because we think that practicing means, oh, I don't have anybody to practice with. I need to be speaking in English all the time, new conversations, new conversations, and that is how my English will improve. Well, I invite you to review that notion, that perception, because it might not be entirely correct, only partially correct. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're interested in improving your English through contemplative practices, through observation and looking more deeply at your own experience, then do make sure that you apply using the link, this link here, which I'm going to put in the description box below also, for a conversation with me about joining my ongoing English training program. And you can also download my free ebook, which is about what you can do to revolutionize your English on your own. It's filled with ideas and suggestions that you can implement straight away in your own life to make incremental, gradual improvements to your English. So that's it for today and I'll see you in the next one. Take very good care until then. Bye for now. <laughs>